Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel for a rather long overdue of uh, episode of Ships of War, the series in which I have a look at uh, naval vessels from the past, the um, famous, the not so famous, and in some cases the downright notorious. And <clears throat> I will usually compare two antagonists who were either involved in a historical conflict or perhaps even fought one another um, and look at them both in their historical context and what they were like as far as we can tell um, historically, but also to um, look at them through the lens of how they're portrayed in a particular gaming system. And in doing this, what I hope to do is just get a sense of how fairly these ships have been represented by the, the game that includes them. And, um, you know, where I think the designer has been faithful to the history, where they might have had to take some liberties, sometimes for very good reasons. Um, others, they may be a bit more questionable. It depends. But today I am going to be looking at um, the famous American Civil War antagonists, CSS Alabama and USS Kearsarge. Now, of course, these two are very well known to Civil War aficionados. They, uh, they fought their famous duel outside Cherbourg in the summer of 1864, and it was a, a fairly epic, if I suppose relatively short, battle. And it was very handily won by the USS Kearsarge. It was a surprisingly one-sided result. And very recently, in completing my series on GMT Games' Iron and Oak, I actually used these two as the demonstration piece um, for how the game system works. So I suppose it, it makes sense that um, I'd had a request or two, and I'd, I'd sort of wanted to move further back into the 19th century with this series than I had done before. And, and perhaps even to treat with vessels which have a foot in both camps, the, the two camps being the steam age, but also the age of the wooden walls. Because as you can see from the very, very well executed illustrations of both ships, they very much do uh, nod quite solidly to both periods. They, they're basically, you know, your classic, um, your classic sailing corvettes, really. Um, but uh, on, on top of that, they have their steam propulsion, which is very much the uh, the 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 uh, it, it's very much a, a feature of naval vessels from the mid nineteenth century onwards. Now, I've slightly misused the term corvettes here because neither of them was that really. Technically, the Kearsarge was a sloop, and in terms of her rig, I mean they're both bark rigged, but the Alabama wasn't a million miles off that either. Um, naval terminology could be quite fluid in this period, but what I will do is I'll start off by giving a bit of the background to these two ships, because um, they're mostly known for the epic battle, and Alabama is justly famous for her hugely successful commerce raiding career. But, um, but where did these two come from, and what were their roles? How similar were they? Both these ships came into being within, well within a year of each other, actually. If I start with the Rebel first, um, of course, because the Confederacy's shipbuilding capability was extremely limited, like a lot of the Confederacy's raiders and blockade runners, uh, and it must be said occasional warships, the Alabama was built overseas, in this case in Britain. She was built by the famous... Um, yard of Laird Brothers uh, in Liverpool and of course she had to begin with a false name which was Enrica. For the longest time she was simply Laird's hull number 290 because of course when a ship's being built it's just given a hull number and she was within an ace of being found out by Union agents in Britain who were, were quite prepared to make a fuss and have the ship impounded because Britain was officially neutral and if it could be proved that the ship that was being built at Laird's was a warship, then there was going to be trouble. So after launch, the Enrica escaped by the skin of her teeth and was equipped out in neutral territory away from British waters um, 
as a commerce raider. So in August 1862, she was ready to go. And she was placed under the command of the very capable Captain Raphael Semmes, one of the most famous of, of Confederate naval commanders. Fast forward two years, and by the summer of 1864, this ship has not only sunk a Union gunboat, which was slightly heavier and somewhat better armed than herself, but she'd racked up an impressive total of almost 70 Union merchantmen, uh, which she'd seized in her capacity as a commerce raider. And this was no mean feat for a vessel like this operating on her own. Um, but of course, as with many such vessels, her luck did run out in the end. And in June 1864, she was finally caught by the Kearsarge. But she'd had an extremely impressive career. She'd sailed all over the world. Um, she didn't quite circumnavigate the globe, but in terms of her mileage, she may as well have done. And she leaves behind a legacy even today. There's the well-known shanty, Roll Alabama Roll, which is a direct reference to this ship. And believe it or not, there are even folk songs about her in Afrikaans and even Malay, which, is, uh, which sounds incredible, but it just goes to show how much of an impact this ship had out of all proportion to her size. Now, so much for the Alabama. What about the Kearsarge? Her um, inception was somewhat less dramatic and less intrigue-filled than the Confederate ship. So the, the Kearsarge was the lead ship of a class of four vessels, which were, were all broadly similar. There was a bit of wiggle room in this period because, you know, different builders would apply their own touches in response to fairly broad specifications received from the US Navy. So the Kearsarge class was simply an improvement on the preceding class of um, Union sloops, so the Mohican type. And so they were somewhat larger, they were equally fast, they were somewhat more heavily armed than their predecessors. So USS Kearsarge comes into being and is formally commissioned in January 1862. Her keel was laid in the year the American Civil War started, so it was a very timely one for the United States. And um, what's remarkable about her, and actually remarkable about both of them, I think, is how similar they are. Um, I mean, she's a very heavily armed vessel compared to the Alabama. She's completed with um, surprisingly heavy guns for a vessel of her size, but not very many of them. So her role is very much a patrol vessel, but she has a fair bit of punch. And when the American Civil War is, you know, really gets going, the Union Navy recognises that it's going to have to blockade the Confederacy. But at the same time, it's also going to have to send ships overseas to deal with the inevitable Confederate raiders. They were prepared for this kind of thing. They knew it was... It was going to be a problem. So Kearsarge's first mission, in fact, is to go overseas, um, out away from U.S. territorial waters to try and keep a lid on um, commerce raider uh, activity. So looking at the game cards here. And just for those of you who've not seen my series on Iron and Oak, a bit of a quick explanation is required. Um, these icons here represent dice. The, the game Iron and Oak is all about opposed dice rolls. So at the bottom left here, we have the ship's armament. When Alabama fires a broadside, she rolls an eight-sided dice. When the Kearsarge does so, she rolls an eight-sided dice and a six-sided dice. So slightly more powerful armament attributed to the Kearsarge. If you look at their... Um, dice allocations in the middle band here what this is is their hull strength and uh, basically an aggregation of the ship's structural ability to withstand damage and you can see they're pretty much identical um six-sided dice for saves when their deck is hit most of the rest of the ships get an eight-sided dice and they're 
And not, so, not to say that these ships had rams, but their structural ability to ram based on the strength of their prow and keel is, is folded into a dice roll of six. Now up here we've got, um, starting on these columns, their undamaged maneuverability is expressed as a ten-sided and a six-sided dice, so they're pretty much the same there. Um, it degrades as they suffer damage, but for the purposes of this exercise, I'm just going to stick to their undamaged maneuverability. Um, the total hits the ships can absorb without sinking is 11, so again identical. Crew strength is slightly larger for the Kearsarge. That number on the right is an uh, is a simplification of the crew total. So it's basically crew points rather than actual numbers. So it's seven for the Alabama, eight for the Kearsarge. They both have the same draft, which um, in keeping with a lot of the rest of their structural information seems about right. So how fair is all this? Well, the trouble when making a comparison between two ships, even two as similar as these guys, is um, we have to try and forget what we know, because any discussion about them is inevitably going to be dominated by the outcome of their famous duel, which ended up being a very lopsided victory for the USS Kearsarge. So I'm going to start with maneuverability. I think it makes sense if I work across the ship data cards, um, sort of top to bottom, left to right. So beginning with the maneuverability, which is not just their maneuvering, but also um, the vessel's maximum speed is folded in. Um, as you can see from the illustrations again, and these are very nice illustrations, there are photographs of both ships, um, Kearsarge being somewhat better represented in the photo record than the Alabama. Um, but I would say that these are pretty faithful illustrations, so we can go by them for the purposes of this exercise. Both ships are bark rigged, so they've got a very similar rig, and they've got a very similar hull form, which would allow them to develop the same sort of speed. Um, Alabama had a lifting screw, uh, a, 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 a system initially pioneered by the British, whereby the propeller could be disconnected and raised when she was sailing, just to improve her hydrodynamic performance that little bit more. Kearsarge didn't have that, but I think her screw had limited feathering capability, so it wasn't. It was not a bad arrangement. And they both have the identical bark rig, so they have a similar turn of speed. Um, Alabama's best speed, as far as is known, under either sail or steam was 13 knots, whereas the USS Kearsarge topped out at about 12. So the two were pretty close in that sense, and to be perfectly honest, in game terms, given how abstracted um, iron and oak can get, I think that a difference of a single knot is not going to make a difference. So... In terms of whether the 10-6, 10-6 equality of maneuverability is a fair treatment of these ships, I would say yes. I, I think that balances out quite well. Now, what about their overall toughness, the ability to absorb hits? Again, I think this is a pretty fair one. So, one thing we can look at, because ships of the, this period, and I should say sloops of this period were really quite fragile vessels. There was not really any such thing as watertight subdivision in these vessels. They were wooden hulled. They were quite vulnerable if they um, suffered waterline hits, particularly in the 1860s when naval vessels carried explosive shells, which could do horrendous damage to unprotected wooden ships. And if you were really unlucky, one or two bad hits along the waterline would be enough to start serious flooding. And if you look at their mass, the Alabama's the slightly lighter vessel because she's recorded as having a tonnage of roughly 1,100, and that's, that's her loaded tonnage. The Kearsarge was somewhere between 1,500 to 1,600 tonnes. That was fully loaded. As initially constructed, she was closer to 1,000, but... 
inevitably when you fit a ship out for war and give her all the extra stuff she requires, she's going to put on a little bit of weight. So at the time that they fought their famous duel with each other in 1864, the Kearsarge was a somewhat heavier vessel, but that doesn't really have much bearing on survivability. Um, in terms of their dimensions, again, you, you can gauge some um, some sense of their their strength of build from that, but not very much. It just serves to underline how similar they were. So Alabama was the slightly longer vessel at 220 foot in length. Kearsarge was about 198, 199 foot. Kearsarge was slightly, and I mean very slightly, beamier. She was just over 33 foot wide at most. Um, Alabama was just shy of 32 foot in width. And um, and actually, I, I've got a couple of photographs. I'm afraid my printer has gone on holiday, so I'm just going to swing round and go straight to this illustration here. Now, this was taken on the upper deck of the CSS Alabama, and in fact, that's Captain Semmes over there, um, leaning up against his ship's heaviest gun, which is um, the uh, the upper deck um, eight inch um, sixty eight pounder. Now you can't really see the edges of the bulwarks from this, but that's the center line, and the bulwark wouldn't have been too far off the picture that way. So these are quite narrow ships. Um, you know, there's not. There's not an awful lot of space to them. And that that narrowness of form is one reason why both the Alabama and the Kearsarge had their heaviest guns mounted on the center line. There's various reasons for this. One was stowage and stability, but also there was an element of maxi maximizing firepower on top of that. So a big gun like that wouldn't be committed to one port or another on the other side. You could actually traverse it to fire whichever way you wanted. If I just flip the page over, this is a similar photo showing the officers of the USS Kearsarge on the quarter deck of their ship. You can see similarly one of their heavy guns is uh, is stowed along the center line, but it has these rails on the deck so it can be pushed to face to port or starboard. So it's they they have a similar sort of flexibility to the Confederate ship. But again, you can see this same very narrow arrangement and it's actually more prominent in this photograph because you can see the bulwark on the other side and the one over here. So really not a lot of space at the end of the day. The rating they're given I think is pretty fair because although one can only try and judge it overall against the other ships in Iron and Oak, I think to pitch them equally given how they were built and their overall physical structure, it seems to me that um, them being able to take the same number of hits is probably right. In fact, actually, I could quote one of the participants because um, Captain Semmes, very shortly before the battle, confided in his journal that, and I quote because I have him on a piece of paper here somewhere, here we are. Semmes wrote, the combat will no doubt be contested and obstinate, but the two ships i.e. Kearsarge and Alabama, are so evenly matched that I do not feel at liberty to decline it. So effectively, he felt that he could take the Kearsarge on. She had entered Cherbourg the day before to get a look at the Alabama, and the Alabama had taken the uh, opportunity to size her prospective opponent up in return. So Semmes felt good about his chances, and he knew his ships, so there were probably good reasons for that. Um, I mean, evidently, Captain Winslow of the Kearsarge knew his ships just as well. So he he probably uh, he definitely felt the same about his odds against the um, the Alabama. What about crew? Alabama's got the slightly weaker rating. Again, this is pretty fair, I think. So this is partly down to the different roles of the two ships. The Kearsarge is a fully armed naval vessel with a heavy armament, 
On top of the requirements for men to sail the ship and keep her engines going and all the myriad of other things, no doubt a complement of marines as well, um, and enough men to ensure that they um, they, they have um, extra personnel, maybe even prize crews if necessary. So around the time of the Battle uh, of June 1864, the Kearsarge's crew stood at something around 160 men. The Alabama, by contrast, had about 140. So it's a very, very slight difference, but it is a noticeable one. Um, there is some uncertainty about how many men were on the Alabama when she went down, but 140 is a rough estimate based on, on um, how many she was supposed to have had on the books when she first arrived in French waters. So it's a slight difference, but it's a reflection of the fact that the Alabama, yes, on the one hand, she is a warship like the Kearsarge, but on the other hand, she's a warship with a very different function. She's a long-range commerce raider. And the sort of balance you want with a ship like that is that you want to maximize your endurance and your fighting capability. But you don't really want any useless mouths on board, or, or maybe not useless, I should say excess mouths that need feeding. So whereas the Kearsarge would be comfortably accommodating enough men to meet all of her requirements and then some, the Alabama would be perhaps running on the bare minimum possible, but not so much that they would prejudice the safety of the ship. And of course, being a commerce raider, she would want a dribble of extra men as prize crews if she happened to take a uh, fairly valuable prize. So that one crew point difference uh, between the Kearsarge and the Alabama, again, I think is pretty fair. Um, I won't linger on the draft being identical because the, the comparison I made earlier of the dimensions and tonnage of the two ships, I think pretty much um, nods to the fact that they drew a similar amount of, uh, uh, of water um, uh, uh, certainly, you know, they, there would have been a similar depth between the bottom of their keels and their loaded water line. So I'm happy with the matching draft of two. I've also pretty much covered the strength of the ships um, in terms of these ratings. They both were pretty similar um, and unmodified. They should, in theory, have had the same level of um, of protection against fire, which is to say not a lot. So although the Kearsarge is a warship and you'd expect her to be more heavily built than a merchant ship, she isn't She isn't really that much more heavily built because she's only a sloop. She's not a ship of the line. So she's going to be fairly light in her structure. Now, this does bring me to a bit of a side issue because famously during the battle with the uh, um, Alabama, the Kearsarge avoided a lot of hull damage by employing the expedient of using sheet chains. These are like, um, uh, call, call them um, moderate sized chains that were, were put together and hung over her machinery spaces. So if you imagine a uh, using your lengths of spare chain to create almost chain mail that could be suspended down the side of your ship to cover your very vulnerable boiler and machinery spaces particularly. And not only that, but they were also planked in behind uh, about an inch or so of wood. So the Kearsarge had come prepared. Um, the Confederates were not very happy about this, and some of them did accuse uh, Captain Winslow after the fact of ungentlemanly conduct for not not sponsoring a fair fight but at the end of the day this was a tactic that the Union Navy had pioneered two years before um, during the assault on New Orleans so the Confederates had no excuse for not knowing about it as a tactic and also uh, in the ter in terms of any military situation I think it's fair that you use every advantage you've got um, and at the end of the day, over his long career as a pro and very successful career as a commerce raider, 
Sems hadn't been above a bit of sub, um, subterfuge and deception himself. So I think there's a little bit of sour grapes there over the fact that he suffered such a one-sided defeat. The um, In terms of the reasons for that one-sided defeat, that's a whole other discussion. But I would suggest that one of the main reasons the Alabama did not win the battle with the Kearsarge historically was more due to the behaviour of her crew. Not to say that they were in any way unprofessional, they were quite a well-drilled crew, but the Confederates favoured a rapidity of fire, uh, whereas the Union ship shot a bit more deliberately and tried to make those shots count. In all, um, Kearsarge fired half the number of rounds that the Alabama did, but her hits were much more effective. And that actually brings me on quite nicely to the final bit of this analysis, which is a comparison of the two ships' weaponry. Now, in terms of the layout of the guns, I've already mentioned the heavy guns are on the center line in both ships. Um, and their lighter pieces were on standard naval truck carriages and they were fixed into their broadside gun ports. I say fixed, they had they had a limited traversability, but you're very unlikely to unhitch something like a 32-pounder from its side and wheel it across the deck to a port on the other side. You could do that in some conditions, but generally speaking, they would stay where they were. Um, you'll note the Kearsarge has a minus three up there and an X there, whereas the Alabama has an X and an X. Now, the Xs mean that they cannot fire out through that arc, so no astern fire for either ship, which is correct. Alabama didn't have any forward firing gun ports, not any decent ones at any rate. The Kearsarge had a limited ability to fire slightly off-bow shots. You couldn't fire dead ahead because of the uh, the bowsprit and associated rig being in the way, but you had some limited ability to put a shot forward. Um, but that, that, so that's permitted in the game, but that the fairly hefty modifier of minus three to the shooting. Now we've seen that the Kearsarge is credited with a significantly heavier armament than the Alabama. Now why is this? Because I asked that question because if you count the number of tubes, USS Kearsarge had seven guns, Alabama had eight. But as is often the case with these things, a number of gun barrels is not what's important. So let's look at sizes. The seven guns on the USS Kearsarge comprised two 11-inch smoothbores. Now, these were huge. They, they were not very accurate weapons, and they were not that long-ranged either, but they were built basically to smash great big holes in things, and they did it really well. The next biggest gun that the Kearsarge had was a single 4.2-inch Parrot rifled muzzle loader. Now, the Parrot um, rifles were a very effective gun, and their main strength lay in their accuracy at long ranges. So the Parrot was basically, if I can call it this, the, the Kearsarge's long-range punch. And her armament was rounded out by four 32-pounder smoothbores. Now, these weapons hadn't changed very much since the days of the Napoleonic Wars. They were basically just a... a in the Napoleonic Wars, they would have been considered heavy. By the time of the American Civil War, they were medium, um, very, very much medium. So the 32-pounders are really there to try and smash up an enemy ship's upper works. And also, over the course of Kearsarge's duties, if she's doing something like stopping a Confederate blockade runner, you're not going to waste your precious 11-inch ammo on a ship like that. You'll probably use the lighter and somewhat handier 32-pounders to do it. So, so much for the Kearsarge. What about the Alabama? Her biggest weapon was a 68-pounder smoothbore, um, effectively an 8-inch smoothbore, very similar to the 11-inches that the Kearsarge mounts, except a much smaller projectile and somewhat less power behind it. But otherwise, it shares a lot of their characteristics. It's not accurate at long range. It's basically a sledgehammer designed to knock holes in things. 
The Alabama also had a Blakely rifled muzzle loader, and there's some variance in opinion as to whether this was a 6.4 inch or a 7 inch, but whichever it was, it was heavier in terms of its shell weight than the Parrot rifle mounted on the Kearsarge. And it was essentially Alabama's equ uh, equivalent. This was her long range punch, this Blakely rifle. And rounding out her artillery park, she had an advantage over the Union ship in having six 32-pounder smoothbores. So, more guns, a greater reach than the Union ship, but in terms of sheer weight of projectile, the USS Kearsarge uh, came out tops. And I think that's the basis of giving them these ratings. So... In some respects, where if you could measure both ships um, full broadsides, the Kearsarge would be able to throw out 365 pounds worth of metal. Um, you compare this to the Alabama at a full broadside from her guns, she'd be generating 264 pounds of metal. So there's a significant gap there, about 100 pounds worth. The question is, does that justify the difference of adding a six-sided dice? Um, it's very different, uh, sorry, it's very difficult to quantify. The answer's perhaps, as far as I'm concerned, because again, you've got the different, the, the question of what happens if an engagement is fought, say, beyond the effective range of the 32-pounders, or perhaps even beyond the effective range of the heavy smoothbores then it becomes a contest of the Confederate long-range Blakely rifle versus the Union's long-range Parrot rifle. Um, and then the advantage swings back to the Confederates. So it's very difficult to say, but if you assume all things being equal and both ships developing their full firepower, then the Kearsarge has the advantage. And I think that is probably a fair one, balancing all the other factors out. Um, as it happens, um, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the course of events of the Battle of June 1864, the Alabama attempted to close the Kearsarge very quickly. And the Kearsarge didn't mind this because they wanted to get their own guns within range. And after a bit of preliminary manoeuvring, the two ships ended up circling each other. They spent about an hour and a half describing seven circles at a fairly steady range while pouring everything they had into each other. And for the Confederates, it was probably a waste of their long-range capability, but there were other factors at play. Um, Semmes knew full well that the supply of ammunition his ship carried had not been replenished since she'd first set out on her mission two years before. So some of his powder had inevitably degraded in the conditions at sea. Most naval vessels would have replaced their stock of ammunition at least once in that period. Um, so he was suffering from defective ammunition. It had been found previously that some of the ship's percussion caps, most significantly for the, um, for the uh, well, basically all his guns depended on them. Uh, and so some of those were defective, which was not good at all. Um, and so he, that may have informed his decision to close and try and overwhelm the Union ship with rapid fire. It may have worked. One of the key moments in the battle is the moment at which the Alabama draws first blood and around from her 6.4 inch Blakely, a shell actually lodges itself in the, st the stern post of the Kearsarge. Now, this is really, really significant because if that shell had detonated like it was supposed to, it was powerful enough to have at the very least destroyed the Kearsarge's rudder at the very worst, it may well have blown a large chunk of her stern away, damaged her screw and caused uncontrollable flooding. That would have left her helpless and sinking. So in a sense, Semmes was right. It could easily have gone the other way. So overall, I think that these two combatants have been very well represented in Iron and Oak. I think the, I think the way the game has treated them is 
as accurate as can be, uh, both under the circumstances and in terms of the kind of action that it's trying to portray. It does seem to be a fair representation of the ships as they were. My only slight concern would be there doesn't seem to be a mechanism for representing the um, Kiyosage's chain armour. So her, her total hits is very much, and her armour protection, well, armour, as much protection as wood can give you, um, is her basic unprotected stat. Um, that's very easily modified in the game term. In game terms, you could simply give her a bonus to her armor protection when she makes her dice rolls, and that solves the problem quite neatly. But other than that, I think that Jim Day's Iron and Oak has done a great job of representing these two ships. And so, um, having gone on at quite some length, I think I will leave the two combatants uh, and your good selves with. Uh, one of my favourite illustrations of the battle, this was executed by a French artist who I think was an eyewitness. So you can't see the Kearsarge because she's quite obscured behind the smoke, but you can see the um, Alabama beginning to go down, foundering after the repeated heavy hits she's taken from the Union ship. And in the foreground, you've got a, a French vessel, one, one of a handful that came in to rescue survivors um, as the action began to wind down. So, uh, with this rather dramatic picture of one of, it must be said, one of the greatest sea fights of the American Civil War, um, I shall thank you very much for um, joining me for this episode. It's really great fun to be back in ships of war and to have been able to deal with these two really, really interesting vessels. Um, I'm always grateful for your company. Thank you guys so much for following um, this video and indeed this series. Um, if you've got any comments, any observations you'd like to make, you're more than welcome. Um, please leave them. I'll try and get back to you as soon as I can. But I hope that you found this interesting and informative. And I very much look forward to seeing you all again in the next one. Thank you very much for tuning in. Bye.